This podcast is brought to you by Free Buddhist Audio, the Dharma for your life. Our work is funded entirely by donations from our generous listeners. If you would like to help us keep this free, make a contribution at freebuddhistaudio.com forward slash donate. Thank you and happy listening. Yeah, thank you very much, Punimala. And yes, I was indeed on the top deck <laughs> of the number 37 going down Afro Road in Brixton, which I still walk down fairly regularly and I still think of that moment. It was a bit like, you know, Banty had his experience in uh, Amen Corner in Brixton, in uh, Tooting. So there's these little kind of holy sites around <laughs> South London, which uh, sites which would otherwise be fairly inauspicious. So yes, yeah, so uh, we're going to look at this theme of the Arya Pariyasana, longing for liberation. Because I think sometimes it's important to step back, to put the book down, or sometimes the computer in our case, to let go of responsibility for at least a moment and start wandering about. That's what I do. Um, I'm very lucky to live at Tiwatna Loka, which is a very beautiful place. So sometimes I go and wander about outside under the light of the moon. I go for a walk in the dark to the chapel, which I'm sure many of you are very familiar with, the graveyard at the chapel, which has got that sort of very sort of still, mysterious atmosphere. Or I wander around outside by the stupa at T. Ratnaloka, having little chats to Dardo Rinpoche, whose ashes are in that stupa. Or I go to where the two rivers meet at T. Ratnaloka. There's a place where two rivers meet. If the water's low enough, I get my wellies and I stand in the water at that point, thinking about things, <laughs> talking to the davers or the trees or the little water sprites, um, of which there are many in Wales. And in a way, what I'm doing is I'm asking them, or maybe I'm just asking myself, I like to think I'm actually asking davers, but I'm probably just asking myself, a kind of wordless question, a wordless question. If I was going to have words for it, it would be something like, what's it all for? There's so much that we do in our lives, you know, and uh, Kennedy's got a sort of euphemism for this. She said, sweetie, we're living a rich life. (laughs) So, yes, a lot of us are living very rich lives. Uh, And um, what that means is somewhat busy, but, you know, what's it all for? (laughs) You know, we can be so immersed in problems and difficulties, interpersonal problems political problems, practical problems, you know, thinking about things about the order or in our local centre or in our chapters. And sometimes it's good to just step back and to remember why we started out on this journey at all. So maybe it's good to also come back to the Buddha. That's the other thing, is always come back to the Buddha uh, as the straight, most sort of straightforward example of the spiritual life. Um, and uh, I really do love... Um, the Sutta on the Arya Pariyasana. Uh, in that Sutta, it's a kind of lovely kind of... I, I, I'm beginning to appreciate these sort of pre-stories uh, more and more as I get older. And um, anyway, so this kind of like little kind of... Um, what's it called? So pre- prelude to the main sutta, part of the Sutta itself. And there's the Buddha, and he spent um, the day in the park. He's gone begging. He's sat in meditation uh, for most of the day meditating and towards the evening he's gone to bathe in the hot springs um, and um, meanwhile some monks have said look it'd be really great if we could see the Buddha they've gone to Ananda and they said it'd be really great if we could see the Buddha um, we haven't heard the Buddha speak for a while so there's the Buddha having his own very simple day and then there's Ananda who's had this kind of mission that the, he knows the monks want the Buddha to speak um, and he said to them, look, the best place to go is Ramaka, the Brahmin's hermitage. So just wait there. So they all go and wait there. And meanwhile, the Buddha's in the park. He's meditated. Um, he's had his bath. And uh, towards the end of the day, the Buddha said, I've just got an idea. Um, why don't we just go to Ramaka, the Brahmin's house? <laughs> um, it's really nice. That would be a great place to go after spending all day in the park, meditating and having a bath. And the Buddha says, yes, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, let's go to Ramaka the Brahmins. <laughs> so um, he goes, oh, I don't wonder whether the Buddha knows he's being slightly set up. But anyway, he goes to the 
he goes to Ramaka the Brahmin's house and he hears the monks inside talking. And then there's this very sweet moment where he waits for the discussion to end. Um, you'd think as the Buddha, thought of the Buddha, you'd just like walk in. But no, he waits for the discussion to end. Um, he clears his throat <coughs> and he knocks and he goes in. And um, they're so delighted to see, see him and he's really delighted to see them. He says, what have you been talking about? He said, oh, we've been talking about, well, you and uh, the Dharma. He says, oh, good, you know, so it is, it's good to speak about those things. And then he just starts talking about himself and his life. And he talks about his own ignoble and noble quest. So he says, and I'll, I'll just read this because it's such a beautiful passage from the Pali Canon. Um, when I was an unenlightened bodhisattva, being myself subject to birth, I sought what, sought what was likewise subject to birth, being myself subject to ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement. I sought what was also likewise subject to sickness, death, sorrow and defilement. Then the thought occurred to me, why do I, being myself subject to birth, seek what is likewise subject to birth? being myself subject to ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement? Why do I seek what is likewise subject to sickness, death, sorrow and defilement? What if I, being myself subject to birth, having understood the danger in what is subject to birth, were to seek the unborn supreme rest from burden, Nibbana, what if I, being myself subject to ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement, understanding the dangers of what is subject to ageing, sickness, <coughs> death, sorrow and defilement, were to seek the unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless and undefiled, supreme rest from burden, Nibbana, so at a later time, while still young, a black-haired young man endowed with the blessings of youth in the first stage of life, and while my parents, unwilling, were crying with tears streaming down their faces, I shaved off my hair and beard, put on the yellow robe, and went forth from the home life into homelessness. So really what the Buddha's doing there is he's communicating to the monks a vision Firstly, he's communicating to them uh, a vision, his, sort of his own central vision, the vision that, that enabled him to move from the ignoble to the noble quest, that moved his emotional centre of being towards the spiritual life. Um, so firstly, he tells them of a vision of the endless round where we always <coughs> seek the familiar even when it brings us sorrow. In the sutta is a list of, of what is... Um, subject to birth, um, ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement. And those lists are a, a list of kind of possessions, uh, as it was understood in ancient India. Um, it's a list of spouse, children, slaves and animals. So um, obviously our lives are quite different from that, uh, in some cases quite fortunately. But what he's doing there is he's describing the way that we build a worldly life. We build a life around ourselves. And those things aren't bad in themselves, except for, of course, slavery, which is bad in itself. Um, but he's not making an ethical point at that point about slavery. Um, what he's trying to describe is he's describing how we um, shore ourselves up, how we build a life to keep ourselves safe and protected, or at least that's what we hope. Um, and these things aren't bad in themselves, but that we actually, we're questing for them as the meaning and purpose in life. We're putting our hearts on those things. So um, the... Uh, the quest, the word for quest in the Aryapariyasana Sutta is Pariyasana. The first part of that, pari, means going round or encircling. Uh, and asana means a desire or longing or a wish. It's a very, very strong word, almost a poetic word. It's not a technical term. So what we have an idea here of we're searching round, it's desire encircling. 
um, the longing in circling. And there's a very important talk that the uh, that Banti gave in 1997 called Reflections on Going Forth, um, which is a really wonderful talk, actually. He prefaces it by saying that he's getting on a bit and it's not his prime talk-giving years. But then he proceeds to give a pretty smashing talk. So um, I think it's worth listening to again and again, actually, that talk. Um, but he points out in that talk that the same word is used for the ignoble and the noble quest. Um, it's this very powerful word, pariasana, going round, encircling with it, our desire, our longing and our wish. Very fully felt word, embodied word. So our desire is encircling something, our desire is circling round something, our longing is circling round something. And in a way, maybe that's always the case, but we've got the ignoble quest where the object what we're, of what we're encircling uh, is um, limited and the noble quest where what we're encircling is unlimited. So with the ignoble quest, our desire encircles the known, the familiar, what we can have or what we can own. It's a life without spaces. It's a life without creativity going back again and again to the same things, the same experience, the known. Um, Banti also talks about this as karma chanda and talks about it as the energy that powers the wheel of life. Um, the wheel of life isn't just a kind of accident. We're powering it, we're feeding it, and we're feeding it with our longing, our longing for what is limited. And he says the energy that powers the wheel of life, the an apariasana, the ignoble quest, influences everything in our lives. What we own, what we do, who we see, what decisions we make, even who we think we are, our politics, our views, our behaviours, what we like and dislike, uh, you know, our, the roles that we inhabit. All of this is powered by the ignoble quest. Um, karma chanda and apariyasana. But the Buddha, um, in the Buddha's life, he talks about an opening within this endless round. And this opening is provided by a question. So yes, he's circling round the known again and again and again. But he starts to question why. In a way, what am I doing with my life? He stands outside his life and looks at it and asks that question. So this brings me back to, um, actually it's a quote from Atisha, uh, who quotes the sage Aryadeva, um, saying, The nature of existence, is it empty or not? Merely feeling this doubt tears samsara asunder. And I really like that quote. It's just that initial question. However that question is formed, tears samsara asunder. The whole world opens up. You know, why? Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we living our life in this way? Um, and I remember little glimpses of those questions. They started around, I think, the age of around 10. There were a number, series of events in my life where I started to question why I could see the life that was presented to me from my family and um, my um, uh, sort of society and the culture in which I lived. Um, and I started to really wonder whether that's what I really wanted to do. And it was almost like I could sense that the framework of living was wrong. So I've had this memory, actually recently I remembered it again, thinking, gosh, this was quite a strong memory for me, which was that... Um, I was in the car, um, it was parked by the shop um, where I grew up, I grew up in Tooting actually. But anyway, so uh, I was in Tooting in this car, my dad was outside the car, he'd been to the shop and he came back and he was accosted by some men who were obviously under the influence of something. Um, and I was inside the car and I could see him looking nervous and he was looking nervous for me. So I went round the car, this is days before central locking, I went round the car, you know, climbing over all the seats, putting all the locks down. But what I remember about that incident is I remember thinking, um, I don't want to live my life like this. 
and this urge to go out and speak to the men to find out what was wrong with them. I, I think I had in my heart this feeling that these men were suffering and, and they were accosting my dad, who then, he was suffering. I mean, he did look relieved that I was going around locking all the door, but doors. But um, I think there was almost like in my mind, there was a structure, this is all wrong. I go and lock myself in the car. My dad looks frightened, tries to get rid of these men. That was the kind of dynamic. And some, for some reason, I thought that was wrong. Um, and it was almost like a wordless question, but why? Why are we just doing the same thing? And then this will happen again, and it will happen again, and it will happen again. That was the sense that this is the dynamic. And um, these men will have an experience of withdrawal. People will kind of frightened of them and, and moving away and I will have the experience of trying to lock myself away from danger I don't know why it, it struck me so strongly but it really did and around that other time I also had a, another experience which was it was the Zeebrugge disaster which some of you might remember and many people got um died uh, as a ferry they left the ferry doors open and I remember standing there watching it on tv thinking I'm just the guy going about to just turn off the TV and go and have my breakfast. But these people's families won't be able to have their breakfast because they'll be too upset. And somehow the structure of that seemed wrong. It seemed flawed that um, I would switch off the TV and then it's like, oh, well, they don't matter to me anymore. And I was extremely upset. I don't think my dad could quite understand why. So it's, I think those, there's those questions that they come in and like the structure of this is all wrong somehow. It's all wrong. And um, why are we just doing the same thing? Could we do something different? And this is the kind of thing that but the Buddha sort of, you can see that sort of simple question opening up, you know, why if I'm myself subject to sorrow and defilement do I just go and seek what is also subject to sorrow and defilement so things that aren't going to solve that kind of problem that are just going to reinforce the problem in some way so the Buddha questions it but then he also um, talks about understanding the danger of questing what is subject to birth, ageing um, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement he talks about it as a danger. The ignoble quest isn't neutral. The energy that powers the wheel of life isn't neutral. It's dangerous. And the word here is adinava, um, very strong word, which means full of wretchedness, horror. That's from dina, which means poor, miserable, wretched, base, mean and low. So there's a vision of the round which is full of horror. Um, it's futile and it's low and it's miserable um, and wretched. So it's not a comfortable suitor, this. You know, you can skim over that word, oh, well, I understood what is, I understood the danger in what is seeking, in, in seeking what is subject to birth, ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement. You can skim over that, oh, it's just dangerous. What does that really mean? It's a vision. It's not a philosophical treaty. It's a vision of kind of horror, really. So out of that, the Buddha talks about this vision of freedom. He said, why do I not seek what is unborn, unaging, unailing, deathless, sorrowless, undefiled supreme rest from burden or sometimes it's translated as supreme security um, from burden nibbana um, the supreme rest from burden is the anutra yoga kema um, anutra um, you know uh, supreme excellent yoga meaning literally a yoke round your neck I don't know if you see because um, it's a you know, this is more like a cultural metaphor that we don't have any more here. But I've sometimes seen in India um, the oxen, the working oxen in the villages in the heat of the day um, with these great big wooden... I mean, you can sometimes find them in old farm, but probably in this country they probably cost like 500 quid or something because they're kind of rustic. But anyway, 
um, <laughs> you know, you can sometimes find them. If you pick one up, they're huge. They're really, really heavy. And there's this oxen in the midday heat just ploughing this field. Um, so it's that. It's the yoga kama. It's saying, and kama means peace, uh, safety, tranquility, calm. So it's like a, it's an image of taking off that yoke, um, taking off that burden, uh, coming to a place of peace and safety, tranquility and calm. And the Buddha longs for that instead. That's what his desire encircles. And I think that that's so strange. You know, like how did the Buddha know there was no one before him that had found the path to peace uh, that he knew about anyway in his world system. So it's so strange that the Buddha based his longing, his search around something so unknown. You know, he hadn't got the example of enlightenment. He hadn't got the example of, of Nibbana. Um, and that's why he sort of phrases it in the negative. I think these negative phrases in, in um, Pali are so interesting because what they're saying is it's not that there is this thing called the unaging and the unailing unborn. It's more like that what he's saying is it's unknown. It's nothing that you know about. The, the um, birth, ageing, sickness, death and sorrow and defilement, we know. But there's a state of being that's unknown, that's none of those things, that can't be categorised uh, or identified so solidly. So he's basing his life, his whole kind of thrust of his life around something that he knows nothing about, that he hasn't got an example from. It's outrageous. It's outrageous that the Buddha, when death is all around him, would search for the deathless. You know, and we can see that in our own lives. There's been a lot of um, deaths recently, including a good friend of mine, Lalita Vuha. Uh, it's all been, uh, and Vidya Siddhi has also died recently. There's been deaths in our order, and we all know people who are ill and ageing and um, people who are suffering. And within that world of birth and death and sickness and um, sorrow and defilement, to think that there would be a state where none of that applied is outrageous. You know, it's a kind of, it's a bold, bold thing to do and secret and strange and wonderful. That conviction is wild, you know, that you will base your life on something so unknown that's nothing like anything around you. But then again, there is something in us that does know and there's something in us that knows exactly what the Buddha means. And there was something in the Buddha that knew it was possible. Um, and the Buddha lived by that. It was enough for him to leave a comfortable life and take up a wandering life, sleeping in, on the ground, you know, eating the leftovers from other people, uh, leaving the palace behind. It was enough for him that he knew what it was so deeply he would give up the palace and wander around as a beggar in the streets and in the jungle. It was unknown, but it was deeply felt. Banti talks about it as a shift in the emotional centre of his being, a shift in the emotional centre of his being. And I think we've all experienced that in some way too. And he knew enough about what it was, what he was searching for. I think this is the other incredible thing. He knew enough about what it was that he knew what it wasn't. So he went to find some teachers to help him. Uh, Alara Kalama, um, who took him to this sphere of no thing. And Udika Ramaputta, who took him to the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And both of those states of mind, you know, if I got into those states of mind to the extent that the Buddha did on tap whenever I wanted them, um, you know, you kind of feel like your life was pretty much done. It would be great. You can sit there all in those states of being. You can sit there all day and be completely at ease. You don't want anything else 
when you're in that state of mind. Um, but the Buddha knew, he just knew, yeah, but it's not what I'm looking for. It's not the unaging, unailing, um, you know, supreme security from bondage. So, yes, yeah, so he had that kind of asana, that longing, the energy that powers the spiral path. Where did it come from and how did he know where to direct it? I think these are the kind of great mysteries about the Buddha. And in, um, in Reflections on Going Forth, the Buddha um, Bhante talks about how strong the ignoble quest is, the energy that powers the wheel. And he says that the noble quest has to be even stronger than that because we've got to shift the emotional center of our being from one to the other. And he says that needs a concentrated act of will. He says it's not just an idea faintly tinged with emotion. He says it's no accident that the Greek, ancient Greeks spoke of the love of wisdom. Love with us is often a very, very weak term. It would be better, perhaps, if we spoke of a passion for wisdom, even a craze for wisdom. So I really like this. I think I really like this also because I think, uh, well, in my imagination, anyway, Banti really embodied a slightly crazy longing for wisdom, a craze for wisdom. And that comes out in his poetry. I want to break through, shatter time and space, cut up the void with a knife, pitch the stars from their place, nor shrink back with lidded with darkness. The eye of reality opens and blinds me blue as the sky. Um, recently, I heard a story where the where Banti said, it's not to take this literally, but he said he felt like a fakir. Uh, which are these kind of Sufi wanderers who have nothing, like the Buddha, Akinshina, the man of nothing, um, whose prime purpose, who everything is just a search for wisdom and a search for love. Uh, that's crazy. You know, they're known as certainly sort of mad people, like the Mahasiddhas, known as mad um, because they will stop at nothing until they reach wisdom itself. That longing encircles the truth, encircles freedom and prowls through the night. So Bhante also says, he says, only too often we set up an idea of the Arya Pariyasana, an idea of the spiral, and then we try to grasp it by means of an intellect powered by the energy of craving. The result very often is what I call literalism. But this is not the way. The way is to learn simply to concentrate initially on the idea of the Arya Pariyasana, the idea of the spiral. We have to learn to appreciate in the full sense of that word. We have to learn to be moved by its beauty. We have to learn to be emotionally stirred by it. And then when we've learned to appreciate it to some extent, when we are moved to some extent by its beauty, emotionally stirred by it, then from deep within there will arise at least the germ, at least the glimmering of the Arya Pariyasana itself. So there's a lot in that. I think first of all is this kind of genius definition of literalism, which to repeat it is... um, an idea of the Arya Pariyasana, an idea of the spiral that we try and grasp by means of an intellect powered by the energy of craving. So this is the antithesis to the Arya Pariyasana. And it's such a danger for us that we think we've got it. We think we've understood Um, We've got a highly developed intellect powered by the energy of craving uh, and the energy of the an-apariyasana, the ignoble quest. And we can wreak havoc with that intellect. It's interesting, actually, um, Dr. Ambeka also had this. He said, um, he said, education is like a sword, but you've also got to cultivate the mind of the person who wields that sword. 
you know, if we've got this intellect, this highly uh, developed intellect, and it's powered by the energy of craving, we can make all sorts of problems for ourselves and for others. Because intellect is a wonderful thing, in a way. Um, we were hearing about this. We had Sabuti did some sessions for us uh, on the college meeting around views. And he talks, you know, about the benefits of the intellect, how important it is, because it abstracts from our current experience and interprets our current experience. Um, he says experience is always constructed, is always shaped by a view. If we think we're having an experience unmediated by um, view, we're wrong. Your view is what shapes your actual experience. It's funny, actually, I had this debate about um, once on a European Buddhist teachers meeting. I had this debate with um, a very senior teacher from a Chan school. And um, uh, it was quite fun, actually, on the thing. We had a kind of, in that meeting, we had um, this kind of debating club. And it was always really late at night. And um, so we got into this debate. And then it actually said, you know, you're completely right. You can't have an experience unmediated by view, by Ditti. He said then that, and even the Chan school really recognises that, the importance of right view. Because right view is what is the holder for your experience. So um, we can either hold our experience, we can either shape our experience uh, in um, right view or wrong view in a, in a helpful way or in an unhelpful way and we've got that choice but the problem is that we're always mediating our sense experience um, the way the yoga child described this is um, through the klishta mana vijnana the, what we sometimes call the defiled mind consciousness all experiences going through this klishta mana vijnana um, uh, and we can use the Klishtan Mana Vijnana to twist our experience into the known, into the ignoble quest, into the familiar, going round and round and round the same grooves of our usual propantia. Um, and the more experienced we are in the order, I think the better we are at doing this. We take an idea... I'm oh, sorry, that is a bit controversial. <laughs> I write that and I just think, yeah, that's really true. But then I think, like, actually, that's a bit rude. You just said that in front of the whole room of board members. Anyway, there you go. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think I'm even better uh, at uh, doing it. My own literalism. But, you know, the more experience we are, the more we think we know what the spiritual life is. You know, we sort of lose a certain freshness and we think we've understood it. Um, we take an idea of the spiral with our intellect and we make it conform to our previous ideas. And if we're not careful, we make it conform to, we sort of shape it in, in tune with the energy that powers the wheel, the ignoble quest. We distort our experience into our old framework. Um, even Buddhism itself, even spiritual practice itself, even the order itself into an old framework, which is, you know, our usual storyline, whether it's anti-authority, wanting more status. In my case, it's over-responsibility. And we can distort, I can distort, the uh, order itself and the spiritual life itself into the, um, uh, with the energy uh, of craving um, and uh, through my intellect. So, yeah, maybe that, just discuss that in your groups. <laughs> but the good news is uh, that Lama Givinda's has actually got a really interesting thing. He talks about the Christian man of Vinyana in a way that I found deeply uh, relieving, actually. He says the Christian man of Vinyana can also be the starting point for wisdom because it includes faith. So he said, actually, the Christian man of Vinyana has an incredibly important role to play. Um which is of a kind of guide, in a sense. We can use it as a guide because we start to question our own, our own story. We reflect, is this the supreme relief? Is this the supreme relief? Is this the security from bondage? And we use our intellect to circle around something unknown but deeply felt. We think it through and we think it through and we think it through. And we discern, you know, we use our, our mind, our intellect 
to discern, is this action supporting the ignoble or the noble quest? And I think it's deeper than even that. Um, It shapes our experience. It's a bit like the opposite of the energy um, powered by, uh, of craving powered by, the intellect powered by the energy of craving. It's the intellect powered by the energy of the noble quest. I think that is also possible. There can be a, uh, a, we can live our lives with the intellect powered by the energy of the spiral. And what happens then is that we shape our experience as everything pointing to the noble quest. So, for example, when we're presented with the reality of death, our own or other people's, we can see that there's a quality in our experience that's beyond death and see what survives death. And when there's sickness and sorrow and defilement, we can see that that sickness and sorrow and defilement is in the context of conditionally rising. That shapes our actual experience. We see it in the moment. It's not even a kind of distant reflection. We shape our experience to see it in the context of conditioned arising. Uh, The way the Buddha put it is you start to sort of really see in all experiences of life This is how it is when having human existence in the world. This is how it is. And everything becomes uh, flavoured or woven through with an awareness of the noble quest, with the energy, the intellect becomes powered by the energy of the spiral. And I definitely have that experience as well. Maybe it's you could say it's it's the intellect is powered by faith. But then everything that happens becomes a deeper awareness of the noble quest. Everything. So it's easy to think that the distinction between the ignoble and the noble quest is a beginner's teaching. You know, is a beginner's experience. But it's central to all of us because it's a shift in the emotional centre of our being. Um... I mean, in a way, it's really just talking about going for refuge to the three jewels. And as, you know, Panti's talked about, um, going for refuge to the three jewels is the central act of the Buddhist life. It happens in different dimensions and at deeper and deeper levels. And I think what I find myself in my Dharma work is that, and what makes it very meaningful to me as well, is that I can circle around something so important to me that it's wordless. But I think it is kind of that shift from the ignoble to the noble quest or even the um, real feeling of the depth of beauty of the noble quest, uh, of the spiral path. It's so beautiful and so real to me, increasingly. So that's the other side of being in the order. It's like um, the more uh, experience we are in the order, we sort of move towards um, that undefined uh, glimpse of possibility. So I've just noticed it, you know, whether it's um, my work as a preceptor or leading a retreat at Tiwanta Loka or, or t- teaching a beginner's class. I taught a beginner's class here. Um, The other day, I was in absolute heaven. I haven't done one for so long. I was so happy that I sang a song at the end. And um, I was told that was bold. Anyway, I think they enjoyed it. But anyway, I was enjoying myself so much, my goodness. Uh, Anyway, I love centres. I love beginners' classes because it was so exciting. They were all going off to learn the Meta Bhavna for the first time. Like the class split, I had them more, but slightly more regulars, and they were going off to learn the Mount Bhavna. That's when my whole life changed. You know, I thought, goodness, what was what's going to happen this evening? <laughs> anyway, um, oh, anyway, no, I've gone back to my notes. <laughs> so yes, uh, you know, it's but it's circling around the same thing. It doesn't matter what level it's at. It's all about this shift from the ignoble to the noble quest, and it's possible, and it's meaningful. And it's kind of what I've always wanted, you know, and what I think other people have always wanted. Um, 
it's that shift from a quest that leads to suffering to the quest from freedom. So, yeah, so where I led the beginners class the other day was um, in Brixton, and there's lots of uh, young young people in Brixton. And you can kind of see these sort of beautiful 20-something-year-olds, and, and so much of life is beginning, and they're so kind of tortured. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's so problems, and, and I just think, oh, gosh, like there's so much that's available to you. Anyway, um, so yeah, we experience this shift in the emotional centre of our being in different ways, in our own language. You know, it's, I'm just describing to you my experience, but you will understand it in different ways. But it's it's profound and it's every moment. Do I go around the same old habit that I've always done, searching for things that aren't going to bring satisfaction? Or do I send the spiral? Do I change? And the Buddhist tradition also comes back to this central shift. Um, in the Mahayana tradition, we've got this beautiful concept of the Adya Ashaya, which is synonymous with the Bodhicitta. And the Adya Ashaya means the great resolve, the intention, um, the great intention. Um, from the Sanskrit dictionary, it comes from a vessel of the body, the stomach, which I think is good, it's sort of like, it's a kind of gutsy word, from the seat of feelings and thoughts, mind, heart and soul. That's where Adya Ashaya, or Ashaya comes from. Uh, perhaps from Asa, which means wish, desire, hope and expectation. So in... Um, yeah, in the Mahayana tradition, uh, particularly the Vimala Kirti Nadeshi, you've got Adya Ashaya as synonymous with the Bodhicitta, but you can also have this term um, Kalyana Ashaya, the beautiful intention, the spiritual intention. And that intention is to leave behind the ignoble quest and resolve, make a resolve, a, a great resolve to live the noble quest the quest for freedom, and not just our own quest, but for others. And I think the Mahayana really brings out the distinctive quality, or Buddhist quality, um, of this quest. Because the noble quest isn't just a quest for a better world without death and suffering, but it's about the removal of the root of death and suffering, which is the kleshas. So actually in the original Ayaparyasana Sutta, um, the word for defilement is klesha. But I think it's the Mahayana tradition that really brings us out. That's the thing we need to remove, is the kleshas, the root of death and suffering. Um, and to do that, we need to take radical responsibility for our own mental states and the actions that proceed from them. So the klesha is an intentional action, uh, uh, Pam Vajra also did some study with us on the co college meeting and this is one of the, the things that I really got out from that study was like the um, importance of the mind training tradition particularly <coughs> the Mahayana tradition more broadly of really training the mind um, to eradicate the root of suffering which is the mind itself which is intentional action which is klesha and do we really believe this, you know, because it's easy to think that um, actually other things are more important. But for the Mahayana, it's the removal of klesha that's the real thing, which means taking radical responsibility for our own states of mind and going forth from blame. And that's what the mind tradition, training tradition is all about, going forth from blame, looking at our own kleshas. Um and abandoning the, uh, or even transforming the energy that powers the wheel, uh, abandoning uh, and transforming ignorance, craving and hatred. Um, yeah, transforming ignorance, craving and hatred. Um, but the Mahayana, also that, and that great resolve, that great intention, um, is also about going towards the noble quest, um, to develop positive states of mind, sort of opposite of the glaciers, uh, particularly metta, that includes others. So metta is a state of being where you're, you know, particularly the maha maitri, the great love, uh, which we're moving towards in the metta bhavna, uh, 
or the Maitri Bhavna. The great love includes others. So it's not just like, sometimes I think we think of the Bodhisattva ideal as this really nice, polite person saying, well, I'm not just going to get enlightenment for my own sake, I'm going to bring you with me, you know. It's not quite like that. It's actually a state of mind, a state of being where you're no longer separate, where you, where what happens to others is deeply connected with what happens to yourself. It's not separate. It's not different. So um, you're starting to see life as one picture, if you see what I mean. So it's not just about your own um, Arya Pariyasana. It's about the Arya Pariyasana of others. It's not just about our own ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement, but the ageing, sickness, death, sorrow and defilement of others. And we all have that potential to be free. It's a vision of freedom, not just for ourselves, but for all beings. So that quest becomes for freedom for everyone, you know, becomes for freedom itself rather than my freedom. Uh, and to make that resolve is the bodhicitta and the start of the bodhisattva path, the adya ashaya, the beautiful motivation that's felt deep within one's being, in one's guts, one's hearts, in the vessel of one's being. And it expresses itself in the vow. <coughs> being who, Beings who are one's mothers and fathers wander in the samsara, and with unbearable longing, we all produce the unbearable longing to become a Buddha. <coughs> so you make that vow not just on your own, but with others also, others who also have that vision to um, help all beings on to live the noble quest, which is the only answer to suffering. The only answer to suffering is the noble quest for ourselves and for others. And I think it's that vow that's really brought out in the Vajrayana uh, conception of the ignoble and the noble quest. So the Vajrayana takes that uh, envisaging of the noble quest as the bodhicitta and the adya ashaya, but it focuses more on the expression of that adya ashaya or that beautiful motivation. Um, and the expression of that Adya Ashaya or Noble Quest is expressed in, in this concept of the Samaya, the bond to the Guru, the Darkani and the Yidam. It's almost like it asks the question, if it's not expressed in an actual sacred bond, how is it really a quest? Sort of taking that mythical aspect of the quest, that the quest isn't just an idea, um, and I think Bhante's really made that clear. It's not an idea, it's a longing. And that longing has to be expressed. It's expressed in the Bodhisattva vow. And it's expressed in the sacred bond towards the transcendental. So one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things that the Vajrayana does is it makes the transcendental utterly compelling. The guru, the darkani, the yidam are utterly compelling. Um, so compelling that they bring all our energies towards them into one supreme quest so that all the energy of the ignoble quest, the energy um, behind the wheel, which, as you remember, is, is terrifying and futile and wretched. It takes all that energy itself and puts it into the spiral, takes it with us into the noble quest and towards Buddhahood. So you have this wonderful figure of Padmasambhava, Padmasambhava engaging with the deeper psychic energies of the ignoble quest and bringing them onto the noble quest, even bringing those energies to protect the noble quest. And he does this by, um, you know, in these demon transforming stories, by learning their true name by, by um, kind of, uh, finding out their bija, their seed in their heart. And I think what this does with um, Padmasambhara in those tantric quests is it's making a recognition that in a way the ignoble quest is a confusion. It's a long, in Bhante's terminology, it's a long circuiting of our desire for enlightenment. It's a long circuiting of our desire for the noble quest. 
And it's interesting that that's why the sort of same word is used, pariasana, for the ignoble and the noble quest. Because it's saying that as human beings, what we do is long. (laughs) We long. Uh, We have a desire. We have a wish. And if we put it into the ignoble quest, it's going to be unsatisfied. We're going to cause ourselves more trouble and suffering. Um, But if we put it into the noble quest, then we can use that power to liberate. We'll move towards liberation um, through the power um, behind uh, the noble quest. So it's almost like that was what Pamasam was seeing. He's seeing these demons of like they're just there. They are full of energy and vitality in the wrong direction, in the wrong quest, and he takes them on to the noble quest. He uses that energy for the noble quest. Um, and also you have in, in, in the Tantra, there's an image which I find really fascinating, actually, which is also a sadhana practice, which is um, the figure of Vajrasattva with the mandala of Herakas at the crown, fierce and terrible in yab yum positions, these great wrathful deities. Um, you've got the mandala of the Vidyadharas in the throat, the dancing, joyful energies, the doif- joyful Yabhyum Vidyadhara is surrounded by the lo- um, surrounding the Lord of the Dance. And you've got the mandala of the Buddhas in the heart, the refined, peaceful energy of, of completion of Buddhahood. And um, I think about that image, you know, that's the kind of culmination of the tantric path, if you like. It's sort of symbolising that all those energies are with you. So you've got the mandala of Herakas at the crown, the wrathful deities, fierce and terrible, um, kind of ugly. And that's the energy of the ignoble quest. And then you've got the dancing and joyful energy of the spiral, uh, which is at the throat with the vidyadharas. Um, the joy of, uh, of the spiral path, promodia. Um, the the uh, upwelling, joyful energies that we experience as we practice the spiritual life and enter onto the noble quest. And then you've got this mandala of the Buddhas at the heart centre, which is the peaceful um, energies of the Buddhas who are, who way they really are the unborn, unaging, unailing, undying sorrowless, undefiled, supreme rest from burden. They symbolise the ultimate culmination of the noble quest. But all these energies are working together in the body. So yes, so all of this, you know, the noble quest and making the transition from the ignoble to the noble quest leaves us this question of how we present the Arya Pariyasana in our own time. And I think what that comes down to is building a culture of the Arya Pariyasana. I think that's what really my life is about. And if my life is about that, I feel really, really grateful for my life. Because I can't think of a better thing to do with my life than build a culture that supports the Arya Pariyasana. And I think the first thing that we've got to do to build the culture of the Arya Pariyasana is we've got to recognise and kind of live in the tension of the ign- between the ignoble and the noble quest. The pull of the conditioned and the pull of the unconditioned. The energy of the wheel, or the energy that powers the wheel of life, and the energy that powers the spiral. And we've got to see how strong both of them are. So there's the, there's the power, um, there's the energy that powers the wheel, the ignoble quest, which is for security in an uncertain world, the search for the familiar. And you can really see this in people's lives. People are struggling. Um, they're given a message which is basically sort of the world is falling apart. You know, uh, house prices are dropping. So they've got houses. Could be good news for others, actually. Anyway, but um, you've got uh, heating, the rise of cost of living. You've got the rise of cost of basic health care. Uh, you've got um, 
wars, you've got the environment, looming environmental crisis. And I think people feel all of that uh, very deeply. So what do they do? Well, what they want to do is um, build a secure life for themselves in the face of that. And I think we shouldn't underestimate how strong that is. I remember talking to um, my partner, 16-year-old daughter, and she was saying, well, you know, we keep constantly giving this message that the world is falling apart and we're the only ones who can do anything about it. Um, you know, that, that uh, and I was talking to another young woman on retreat, she was saying that her friends just feel despondent. They feel like the world is burning, like literally burning. There's a financial crisis looming. Um, and there's no one... There's no statesmanship. There's no one kind of guiding people into a better future. There's a kind of life without hope. Um, so I think we've got to really, really understand how strong the pull is then for security and um, in a way be sensitive to that. But I think there's also, you know, there's the pull of the conditioned. There's also the pull of the unconditioned. And Banti is so optimistic that that can be found within everyone. And we've got to recognise that as well and give it uh, expression, support that aspiration. I've been following the protests in Iran and China and been deeply moved. Those people are willing to risk death to change their society. You know, uh, death, imprisonment. Um, to change their society. Those people are literally willing to die for freedom and not even necessarily their own freedom, but for others. And I think there's something in there, you know. So yes, there's this ignoble, and there, but there's also the noble uh, quest and it's there and it's present. Um, we're not living in like the Buddha who had no previous example of what enlightenment is. The Buddha provided that for us by the Buddha's enlightenment, um, by the fulfilment of his own quest. He left that quest open for us. Uh, the way Sabuti talked about it recently, he said he changed the spiritual economy of the universe. <laughs> Not quite sure what that means, but I kind of kind of get it. It's like he restructured the whole thing. His enlightenment restructured the whole of reality. So that enlightenment really is possible. And it's also something, strangely, that we can tune into. Um, those forces are alive in us and alive in others. And then somehow through the Buddha's own enlightenment, he may, left that quest open. So what we've got to do is really live that out in our own lives. If we're going to encourage it in others, we've got to live it in our own lives. We have to love that. We have to love the pull of the unconditioned. We have to craze for wisdom. It's got to be vital and vibrant and alive and deeply felt in us. And if our lives are getting in the way of that love, then we've got to live a different life. We mustn't let our lives get in the way of our own noble quest. We've got to risk everything for that noble quest abandon everything for that crazy love of wisdom. Um, that's, in a way, the, my most important thing I have to do in this life. But we've also got to, so, you know, I've got to really live the noble quest in my own life, but I've got to make that available for others. And I think that's where ordination comes in. I think, in, the, in a sense, what all ordination is, is recognising that quest in others. And it might be half formed or unknown or unarticulated, but I can see it. I can see it in, my, in other people because I can see it in my own life. It's alive to me. So it's alive in other... I can recognise that aliveness in other people. Um, and we need a culture that supports the noble quest, um, that gives us a means for people to develop it. And I'm going to say something really unpopular now. Um, and I'm ill, by the way. So no one's allowed to be horrible to me. Because if you're horrible to me, you're being mean to an ill person. So anyway. Uh, yeah, so what we've got to do to support that culture of the noble quest is to support the institutions. Institutions. <laughs> Uh, as um, 
Yes, well, institutions, the word institution and institutions themselves have a very bad name, sometimes for good reason uh, in the past, but they have generally have got a bad name. To quote Don Etar, they are unsexy. <laughs> to quote Banti, they have a bad press. And they've got such a bad press that we now have to call them collective contexts. <laughs> so it's a bit like... I kind of think, well, there's also collective context, like an orgy is a collective context. You <laughs> might call it an institution. Anyway, sorry, that was my mind. My, my, my. um, so everything uh, Banty makes, he's got this wonderful talk. If you ever just want to hear a Banty talk, and you just want to hear one for no, no reason, my favourite go-to is the Fields of Creativity talk. It's really long. Anyway, so... Um, and he talks about uh, he talks about um, institutions as a field of creativity, and he says that everything that is alive is organised and has a structure, and without that structure, it dies. Everything that alive has a it has a structure, and death is by definition a disorganisation of that structure. You know, as a human being, you have um, this is where I really fall down on this, but. You know, you've got a skeleton and you've got a system of cells and um, veins and muscles and everything that's alive. You're a structured being. And when that structure falls down, by definition, you die. Um, So it's very strong. Without a structure, things die. Um, And organisation within a culture keeps it alive. And he says we need a lot of people to organise a culture. So he's saying that in a way, the, well, he's not, in not just in a way, he calls the institutions a field of creativity along with the arts, meditation and friendship because that's how we organise ourselves and that's how we keep the Arya Pariyasana alive. The institutions keep the noble quest alive. Even the Buddha needed institutions. Even the Buddha, when he opened up his own noble quest, when he had that emotional shift in the centre of his being, he went and sought teachers from the Shramanera tradition. You know, he said that um, the Buddha wouldn't have been able to do it, he wouldn't have been able to live the noble quest if there wasn't at that time in India uh, a very specific wandering renunciant wisdom-seeking tradition, which was the Shramanera's. And he joined in with that. And to keep the Buddha Dharma alive, he established his own Sangha. Otherwise, people drift away. They have a great intention, a beautiful intention, a great resolve, but there's nothing to meet it. There's no sacred bond to meet it. The high aspirations of youth become a dream in old age. So it needs to be channeled, the... uh, the noble quest, the Adya Ashaya, needs the vow, needs the sacred bond. I remember when I was younger and I went to Tiwatna Loka, um, I said to Anjali that I wanted to spread the Dharma, the Dharma was very important to me, I also needed to refine what was a very unrefined being. She said, yeah, no, that's fair enough. She said, you just need to live in a community and work in a team-based right livelihood. So I had no responsibilities. I lived in a community. I lived, worked in team based on livelihood. It was like taming of the shrew, <laughs> you know. Um, but I needed that. That she met my noble quest and put it into an effective organisation that kept it alive. So it's up to us. Uh, the noble quest is up to us, and it's up to us to feel it deeply. Um, to give up the ignoble quest, to have a crazy love for wisdom and to help other people in their crazy love and to bring the energy of the wheel to the energy of the spiral and create channels for that energy so that it can grow and flourish and help other people in their own noble quest. So just to finish, we're going to go into chapter groups uh, in a minute and um, maybe we can talk about what are our own experiences of the ignoble or noble quest and um, what did you meet that helped that noble quest flourish? I mean, I'm hoping you're all going to say, yeah, I kind of think broadly I'm on the noble quest. Yeah. 
<laughs> but yeah, you know, what did you meet in your life that helped that noble quest to flourish? What encouraged your noble quest? And particularly any institutions that helped your noble quest, help facilitate that quest. I was just thinking, you know, Sabadra Mati and I have been here all, all week. We've had various meetings. We've been here for future Dharma Fund meeting and then a Team Up Local Unlimited meeting and then a meeting about the Order Weekend. And all of those things, you know, sometimes I can think, my goodness, what am I doing? Uh, but all of those things are channels for the noble quest. And I think for myself, that's what's made, that's what's very meaningful for me. Um, they're not without their purpose. But sometimes I have to really step back and see what the purpose of those things really are. So I'll leave it there. We hope you enjoyed this week's podcast. Please help us keep this free. Make a contribution at freebuddhistaudio.com forward slash donate. And thank you.